Welcome everyone to New York Buddha Dharma. We are <clears throat> discussing death and the bardas. Um, and uh, we've been working our way through a, one particular book, an appropriate book for this center. This is Melanda Bodhi, the center that we rent space from. And the main teacher here is person in that chair. His name is Sugjan Panmat Rinpoche. And the book uh, that we're working our way through, for those of you who wish to, is his book called Mind Beyond Death. It's one of many books having to do with death and the bardo states. These are particularly Tibetan teachings, Tibetan Buddhist uh, you don't really find them anywhere else. They come from India, but um, Buddhism left started leaving India probably in about the second century uh, BC. Went first to Southeast Asia via Ceylon, and um, the kind of Buddhism that went there is now called Theravada. Uh, after the Buddha died, he died in about 580 as near as anybody can tell, 580 BC. Um, the Sangha eventually fractured into what are known as the 18 schools. Who knows if, how many there actually were, but that's what the lore that's handed down. And one of those schools was called the Slaviras. It means in Sanskrit, it means elders. That school went to Ceylon, and Slavira was translated into Sulanese Pali, actually, as Terra. And so that school became the Theravada school, which exists today in Southeast Asia. Vada means doctrine. So it's the doctrine of the elders. And it, in Sanskrit, it would have been the Slaviravada uh, school, which actually disappeared in India um, and is, survives in Southeast Asia. Then around the time of Christ, um, funny way to put it, but that's what it was, uh, around 0 BC, AD. Buddhism began to leave India and make its way to China, and eventually from China to Mongolia, um, Korea, and in the 7th century to Japan. Uh, the kind of Buddhism that went was Mahayana Buddhism, <coughs> and that's another subject altogether. The three different sort of divisions of Buddhism that were made later by Buddhists, the Hinayana, the Mahayana, and the Vajrayana. Meanwhile, the Vajrayana was also developing in India, probably in the forests, uh, forest yogis. And eventually, sometime around six or 700 AD, it came out of the forests and went into monasteries and became part of the monastic Buddhism in India. And there it uh, flourished. Uh, all three schools flourished. And starting in about the 7th century AD as well, uh, Buddhism began to leave, be trained, not to leave, but to be taken out of India as well to Tibet. The first great travelers came. Um, and um, the first king in Tibet to a Buddhist was a man named uh, Songsen Gampo, and he uh, married <coughs> a Chinese princess who was a uh, Buddhist, and she uh, brought Buddhism to him and to Tibet. It didn't really begin to take off until the 8th century <coughs> when a very devoutly Buddhist king named Trisong Detson, quite famous in lore, um, decided he really wanted to establish Buddhism in Tibet, and he invited a um, great Mahayana teacher from India named Shantarakshita to come and uh, teach. Shantarakshita came and the story goes that he uh, converted some disciples and uh, he was a Mahayana style Buddhist, not Vajrayana. And he began to build the first monastic institution in Tibet in Lhasa called Samye, Samye Ling, it's still there today. Uh, but he had great difficulty because 
by day he and his monks would build buildings and by night the local deities, uh, the local spirits native to Tibet would tear it down. And um, <clears throat> eventually he went to King Trisong Detson and he said, look, he said, I don't have enough oomph uh, to get this done. He said, you need someone with more mojo <laughs> or words to that effect. And um, there's this fellow in India named Padmasambhava, uh, who we did the chant to today. He goes by many names. Padmakaran is one, and that's what he is in the chant. In the northwest of the land of Uriyama, on a blooming lotus flower, you have attained supreme wondrous city. You are renowned as Padmakara. Padmakara means lotus born or risen from a lotus. So does Padmasambhava. Um, and he has other names as well. And he was a great tantric master, very, very powerful. And he agreed to come. And there's a whole story about how he came and he subdued all these demons. In fact, he converted them and made them into Dharma protectors, protectors of the Dharma. And they still are today, a lot of them. And we do chants to them sometimes. Uh, they're Dharma palas, meaning Dharma protectors. And um, <coughs> he brought the first teachings to Tibet having to do with death and the bardo states. Uh, these, Padmasambhava was a great um, master of terma. What that means is that he had many, many teachings that he knew were not appropriate for the people of that particular time and place, but would be at some point in the future, maybe hundreds of years in the future. And so he hid these teachings, knowing that they would be discovered when and by whom, actually by whom. And among those teachings that he hid uh, to be discovered were the teachings on the Bardo states and the teachings about what happens uh, as one dies and then after death and then bef up until rebirth. Bardo literally means interval, from to, bar, do, from to. Anything is an interval. There's the bardo of our meeting here tonight. But there are six main bardo states that a being goes through as they transmigrate you know, through the endless rounds of samsara and confusion until they achieve enlightenment. Once they achieve enlightenment, there are no more bardos. There are no, there's no more movement. Um, because you're just enlightened in the present moment. But until that happens, you die and are reborn and you go through different phases. And there are six main bardo states, uh, four of them having to do with this life and two having to do with the span of time, if you can even call it that, time, between death and rebirth. And I question whether you can call it time because there's no more sun and moon, uh, the world has disappeared one has lost one's body, and um, it's like a dream state. Maybe. Um, I'm, I, I, I think I'll retract that. Um, it depends on which bardo we're talking about. So the six main bardos are the bardo of this life, which is what the subject is for this evening. And within that bardo, there are three others. There is the bardo of dream, which we will deal with next week, perhaps, if we don't deal with something else. Um, this has to do with dreaming, like you dream at night. But also, we dream during the daytime, too, we, because we see the world through a veil, a veil of our preconceptions that have been formed by our past karma. And so we often walk around liking one person, disliking another person whom we've never even met just because we are seeing them through this veil, they remind us of something in the past. The second, um, third bardo, within the, the second one within this life, the bardo of this life, um, is the bardo of meditation. And we'll come to that. And it's really, that bardo is Vipassana, the practice that we do here every time we meet. And that I'm hoping that everyone's doing at home because it is the ultimate practice in Buddhism. And it prepares you for death 
and takes you all the way to enlightenment itself. The fourth bardo, which sometimes is, quite, is not connected with this life, but really is, is the painful bardo of dying. And that bardo begins when you contract the condition that's going to end your life, whatever it may be, and then the end of your life. And that is described in detail, that process of, the, of dying. And it's both physical, and at the end of the physical process of dying, that's what Western medicine would usually, that's when Western medicine would usually pronounce the individual dead, flat line, no heart rate, uh, no breathing. But from a Buddhist perspective, that's not death. There is a subtle dissolution that takes place beyond that, which has, is purely mental. And it's only when that dissolution, of the dissolution of mind itself, has come to its conclusion that the person is actually dead. And that's a very important juncture uh, because most people pass on into the next bardo. And the next two bardos are the bardos of death. And the first one is called the bardo of reality. It's the way it's usually translated. It's the bardo of dharma ta, dharma ness, uh, chunyi bardo, same thing in Tibetan. And uh, this bardo is connected with the Sambhogakaya realm. In it, one sees reality, uh, the reality of the way in which appearances present. Appearances are everything, objects of sight, sound, smell, taste, touch, and mental events. And the way they really present, really present, is described vividly in the bardo of Dharmata, the bardo of reality. And it's quite a magical um, description. Sometimes it's possible to see the things that are in the bardo of reality without being dead. You can do it. There are practices that are very important, actually, connected with uh, the great perfection teachings. And um, you can actually enter into states where you see everything that is described in the bardo of dharmata, the bardo of reality. And there are also experiences that people can have, near-death experiences, that will propel them into seeing this. And I know this firsthand because I have a cousin who is very dear to me, um, who is, um, in has stage 4 <coughs> cancer, and it metastasized to her brain. And she had to have a craniotomy. That means they took her skull off and um, went in to remove tumors. And when they put it back on, she began seeing what is, I can only say, her descriptions. And she doesn't know, you know the descriptions of the Bardo of Dharmata, and they are perfect. She is seeing what that, and we'll discuss that when we get to that. It'll be a few weeks before we do. The last of the Bardos is called the Bardo of Becoming. And if one fails to achieve enlightenment at the moment of death, and there's a great opportunity for it there, if you've trained. And how do you train? By practicing Vipassana more and more and seeing this luminous, empty reality. And if you miss that, then you move on into the bardo of Dharma Ta and you're seeing reality again. And there's a tremendous opportunity to achieve enlightenment there. They say that you can stay in the bardo of reality for five meditation days. This is interesting. A meditation day um, is the amount of time that you can stay present without drifting off into thought. So if you can stay present for five minutes, you'll remain in the bardo of dharmata for 25 minutes. If you can stay present for five days, you'll stay in the bardo of dharmata for 25 days. Huh? How many what? And I'm talking about dharmata now. And then, um, but if, like most people, you haven't practiced 
and you haven't developed the ability to stay present. I mean, most people, including us, are lost in thought. We walk through there our days dreaming, dreaming, dreaming. We, perhaps as meditators, less than others. But for many people, their whole identity is in thought, perhaps the majority of the world's population. And for them, they'll pass right through the bardo of dharmata just in a finger snap and into the bardo of becoming. And the bardo of becoming, they say, lasts for 49 days. Now, these are figurative uh, because there's no sun and moon. It's dream state. Uh, and it's propelled by your past karma, just as your dreams are at night. You know, what is in your past, what you've been trained for, what you have been habituated to, rises into semi-consciousness, and you dream uh, the bardo of becoming, until finally you become lonely, and you decide that you want to actually take birth, and you long for, for parents, and then you take rebirth and you're back into the bardo of this life again. Tonight we're discussing the bardo of meditation. And um, this is very important because we're concerned with how to make our lives meaningful and transform the circumstances in, of our lives into the path of awakening and to prepare for death which for some of us is closer and closer. I'll tell you what happens. When I was about 30, uh, I remember I have a close friend. His name is Reginald Ray, Reggie Ray. Some of you may know of him. He's a very well-known Dharma teacher. And we went out for lunch, and I was saying to Reggie, you know, I know I'm going to die someday, but I don't feel like I'm going to die. You know, it feels like this is just going to go on and on and on. I said, and I would like to know, feel that I'm going to die. I said, because then it would change the way I live my life. I would live it perhaps with more meaning and more purpose. But I couldn't make it happen. Well, I'm 75 now. That was 40 some, some odd years ago. And I want to tell you, I believe it. <laughs> I've had so many friends die. When you, I've been part of the Buddhist community for so many years now, 50, that I know a lot of people. And when you know a lot of people, you know a lot of people who are dying at this, this age. Trungpa Rinpoche once looked out at us many years ago and said, you'll be dropping like flies. And <laughs> it's really happening. Oh my God, I call up friends of mine and find out who else has died this week or this month. It's amazing. People I never would have thought would die, you know, or young or early or whatever. So it really comes. So this is, this, the bardo of meditation is really preparation for death because the way in which you live your life with awareness is the way in which you have a good death and a good rebirth if you're going to be reborn. Awareness is key. It's key to living a good life. If you don't have awareness, you get lost in dream, and you circle endlessly through the different dream states, which are called realms, the six realms of samsara, of suffering. And sometimes they're pleasant dreams, like you're in the God realm, and you've got lots of money, and you, everybody's happy, and you know, you're having lots of sex, and whatever it might be. And then turn the corner, and suddenly, you're in the hungry ghost realm where everything is being taken away and you're hungering for more and you know you wish you had more and you feel like you're just this poor wretched person and then turn the corner again and you might be in the hell realm or the animal realm and they're not pleasant places and these are dream states these are conditioned by our mental events so to practice coming back into awareness we're continually cutting those dream states, the only thing that cuts them is awareness practice, coming into awareness. And you cut through thought, and you free yourself from the tyranny, the tyranny of thought, thought and emotions. Emotions are just bigger thoughts. The tyranny of mental events by coming, by how, by coming into clear, thoughtless, awake, 
awareness of what is going on now, which is real. Thoughts are just fictions, fictions, stories that are being told. And there's a whole description of how they're created and why out of our past habituation and experiences, which is what is called karma. He says, the relationship of our mind to our body is that of a traveler to a temporary abode. How about that one? That this body, which is aging, I mean, if I look in the mirror, I can, it just, <laughs> it's wild. I mean, just a minute ago, I had a full head of hair. Can you believe that one? <laughs> yeah, he can. <laughs> I've still got photos of me with a lot of hair, you know, when I was a kid. Uh, it just a split second, a finger snap, the way this all goes. And what is traveling, what always feels constant, is this awareness of the present moment. That's what he means by the mind. Now, the mind is not one thing. It's not something continuous that doesn't change. It's changing continually. It's like a flowing river. And yet there's some kind of continuity to it, just as there is in a flowing river. And yet it's never the same from one instant to the next, just like a flowing river. That's what the mind is like. It's a constant uh, flow of change, endless change, impermanence. And it inhabits this body, which is also changing, but it looks like it's changing more slowly than the mind. The mind's changing every instant. And so he describes the mind as the uh, traveler, which inhabits this vehicle, the body. It's just that, you know, it's a, it's a common trope in Buddhism. Everything changes. Someone asked Suzuki Roshi, the master of Zen Center back in the 70s, to sum up Buddhism in a few words, and that's what he chose to say. Everything changes. The heart of Buddhism. And what Trumper Rinpoche said was that the death that we all fear is just the death of part of it, the death of this body. But it's the most profound change you will experience. It's one thing to lose, have an automobile accident and lose your car. It's another thing to lose your hair and your youth. When you die, you lose your body and you lose the whole world because all your senses disappear. So it's the most profound of all changes. Hmm. He talks here about the dance of appearances in section. Appearances, it's, it's important to understand that what makes up reality, which is only takes place in the present moment, is space. Space is the great accommodator. It's temporal, it's physical, it's the womb, and it's also the graveyard out of which all phenomena arise and into which they pass away in the present moment. It's just a concept that John was has a past that came in the door and has a future that will leave the door leave this room. The reality is just what we experience here and now. And that is changing at every instant as you turn your head, as these words come out of my mouth and pass away, as you now become aware of your bottom on the seat now that I mention it, whatever it is, of your saliva in your throat now that the attention is directed there. All of these things are arising and passing away momentarily. They are called appearances. And that is a key term in Buddhism. Appearances arise and pass away instantly in the present moment. They do it so instantly that you can't distinguish birth from death. They are simultaneous. There is no time when there's something is born and then a, another time when it dies. It, it is dying as it's being born. Everything in this present moment constant fluxing. And working with these appearances 
is really the basis of our path. That what we are describing, you see this fact that nothing, none of this has any real substance, that it's changing as you look at it, as you experience it, is called emptiness, shunyata. Emptiness means having no real substance, no svabhava, as they say in, the, in Sanskrit. Svabhava means own being. Nothing has its own being. Everything is just this instantaneous presentation and passing away. That's how things express themselves. That's how things, these words come out, meanings and colors and everything. In this temporary, this transient appearance. But we live stories, stories that we have made up, which have been fed to us, which we've created. These stories <coughs> have past and future, and they're full of anxiety and fear and hope and resentment and all the other emotions, full of a kind of a tension, a turmoil. And so we bring all this to the path of enlightenment. How? Through study and practice, especially practice. And practice is the constant practice of coming back out of dream into the present moment, however we want to do it. It says, if we practice, we will possess the equanimity and strength of mind that allows us to reflect with awareness on whatever appearances arise for us without reacting to them in our repetitive, habitual way, which is what we usually do. We act in a very sort of knee-jerk fashion, especially with the clashes. Think about it. Think about someone who's hurt you, who's wronged you. And every time you think of that person, oof, up comes that resentment, that anger, that hurt. It's repetitive. It's habitual. You have no control. But you do have some control because you can uh, choose to come back to awareness, not to go into action. Often we just go into action. Want to get revenge, let's say. I'm picking this one because it's such a powerful one. And the whole uh, point of meditation practice is that we're not going to be propelled into acting out the dream. Then we become sleepwalkers, acting out dreams of the past and the future. So there are pure appearances and impure appearances. This is a term we need to learn. Pure appearances are this world seen as it is arising in the present moment, stripped of all these habitual projections, interpretations, good and bad. And it's luminous. And it's empty. Empty of what? Empty of its own being. Empty of any real substance. Because it's just this arising and passing away in the present. It's luminous. You see, when we see things through the veil of our preconceptions, we gray them out. We, we see them through thought. It's kind of like if a person's really lost in thought, and you can be, and each one of us has experienced this, someone might call your name and you wouldn't even hear it because you're so lost in some dream or, or another, Perhaps probably a dream of anxiety. Thought grays out our senses. And when we practice meditation and we come back into the present, everything becomes much more vivid. And they call that vividness luminosity. It's the luminos And luminosity doesn't mean just visual. It's auditory, tactile, olfactory, you know, smell, taste, gustatory. Um, all of it is this luminous quality of vividness. This is pure appearances. Impure appearances are we attribute true existence to Joe, to the camera, you know, to the table, to the floor, to me above all, to me and you. And when we attribute true existence to these things, well, these things are like blocks, and they've got a relationship between them. What's the relationship? Well, if you move the blocks closer together, they like each other. If you move them farther apart, they don't like each other. They hate each other. And if they stay the same distance, there's indifference. These are called the three poisons, the three passions. And as long as we believe, you know, see the world in imp as being impure, that means 
tainted with like and dislike, love, hate, hope, fear, all of that, concretized into things, then we're constantly caught in these games, these terrible games of the emotions. And we don't see emptiness. Emptiness is that things have no true, true existence and it goes together with luminosity. They are two sides of the same coin. If there is emptiness, flip it and it's luminous. That means that all the appearances are rising and passing away luminously. The term in Sanskrit is prabhasvara and in Tibetan is ursel. Yeah, in this part, in this part of the bardo of this life, we have an advantage, which is that the physicality, which is really just slow change, slower change or seeming slower change, can anchor us. We can come back into the world of the senses from the world of dream. You know, we're off dreaming about what that son of a gun said to me before, you know, last week and blah, blah, blah. And then suddenly a horn goes off in the street. We're back on the corner of Broadway and 42nd, <laughs> which is a trip in itself. And then we're, but we're awake for a moment. So the physical world gives us that advantage. He says it is important to take full advantage of our current situation by developing further mindfulness, awareness, and meditative stability. If we can realize the nature of mind, which is nothing but this. See, the true nature of mind is here, now, all the time. It never departs. It's here in this space. It's the fact that everything in this space in the present moment is known to us. That knowingness is the real meaning of mind, and we can rest in that. And it makes us much more intelligent and responsive and subtle. He talks about the importance of study, contemplation, and uh, meditation. Study, it's very simple. I mean, study basically introduces us to a new way intellectually of see, uh, understanding ourselves in the world. And that's important because otherwise we just go along worrying about paying the rent, having love, having a good meal, all those things which drive us. But when we begin to study the Dharma, it begins to offer us new understandings that we never had before. And those are, can wake us up and move us out of our habitual world. Contemplation is that you think about these things and you bring them to your experience and understand them in terms of your experience. Your understanding becomes clarified and you have a deeper understanding. And uh, the, the concepts become more of a living experience. But the last of the three is the most important and that's meditation. Because with meditation, you actually are practicing waking up. Trungpa Rinpoche, who was my teacher, uh, once said, if you only study and contemplate and never meditate or meditate too little, it's like getting in your car and turning on the engine and never putting it in gear. <laughs> you have to practice. And the more you can practice, the better. Um, I, I've got a, an example, an exemplar right now. I'm reading Yuval Noah Harari's latest book. Yes, you, here's one who knows the name. I would say that maybe one out of every four people know the name, but if you mention the book Sapiens, how many people here know what's the book Sapiens? Raise your hands. One, two, anybody? Oh, that's unusual. I would say in my experience, usually about three out of four people or two out of three anyhow know the book Sapiens. That was his first book. He has written three books now that I know of. Um, I'm reading the third, which is really terrific. Uh, the first, one, first two 
Sapiens and Homo Deus have sold 15 million copies and have been translated into 50 languages. That's what it says on the back side of the books that I'm reading now. Um, this guy is an Israeli trained, at, I think it was Cambridge, as an historian, teaches at the University of Jerusalem history and writes these books. He also, he's only about 40 some odd years old, um, he has for the last 20 years meditated two hours a day. Two hours a day. <laughs> I'm going to repeat that. And every year goes on meditation retreat for 60 days. Yes. And I know he's coming to talking about meditation at the end of his third book, 21 Lessons for the 21st Century, which is a real stunner of a book. It's terrific. I really just, I'm, admi I'm an admirer of the guy, partly because of his commitment to meditation practice. He, he practices in the uh, Southeast Asian tradition. So, um, he recommends the author, that we identify those patterns of mind that will impact us most as we face our, face our death and undergo the experiences that lead to rebirth. Now, each of us has our own style of neurosis. And we probably are barely aware of what our particular unique style is as opposed to someone else's. But it's very good to begin to identify it because that style of neurosis is not your friend. And especially as you go into death, that style of neurosis is going to assert itself and really have an effect, especially if you get to the bardo of the coming and are about to take rebirth. It's like, what kind of dreams do you have at night? What are the dreams you have in the day? What are your daydreams? What keeps you awake uh, at night? And what you know, drives your anxieties during the day? It's very good if you can begin to start to identify what each one of us, what our particular style of neurosis is. It might be um, jealousy, that we're jealous of other people. It might be um, anger and fear, that we're afraid of being crushed and destroyed. Of other, you know, by other people or by circumstances, whatever. It might be that we feel impoverished. Um, it might be that we're just terribly passionate, that we want to have more wonderful, pleasurable experiences all the time. Sex, food, beauty, um, comforts of all kinds. All these, there are many different styles. You can use the six realms uh, as a identifiers to help you search through your mind to decide, decide what it is your particular versions are. He says it's important to identify these major life patterns, especially those we repeat. Try to identify which repeats most often and which gets out of control the most. The klesha, that's this defilement, might be jealousy, might be anger, might be hunger, might be passion, uh, might be pride, or all kinds. The, gel the klesha over which we have the least control is the one we should identify and work with first. That means you see it. Then we can apply whatever insights we gain to all of our other habitual tendencies. It's so important to begin to re become aware of our one's emotions rather than constantly reacting. What most people, what including us, do when you experience an emotion is you want to get rid of it in one way or another. And there are two main ways to get rid of an emotion. You either stuff it or you act it out. So if it's anger, you might repress it. And if you feel depressed, it's an old saw of psychoanalysis that depression is repressed anger. The other way to get rid of anger is to punch somebody in the nose or attack someone, insult them. And it's the same with all the emotions. You, they're either repressed or they're acted out. They are not seen. And here's another little cultural thing. I am so amazed at this movie that came out. Um, it's the Tom Hanks 
movie about Mr. Roberts. Stunning movie. How many people here have seen it? One, two. I recommend it. And there are articles online being written about it um, that are quite extraordinary. Uh, there was one in the New York Times recently about how what this movie is about is working with the emotions. And this the writer um, attributes it to the, the, the understanding of how to work with the emotions to, I think, was it? I'm forgetting. Um, one of the psychological traditions. Huh? Say it again. Yes. I don't remember the film. I think so. That's the the writer. I think. But what was the? What? Oh, what was the? What was the name of that? Oh, I just spell it. Horny? No, there's another, there's an interpretation of, um, basically it has to do with becoming aware of the emotions. And the description of the, in that article could have been a Buddhist, Tibetan Buddhist description of how to work with the emotions. It has to do with bringing them to awareness. And that's one of the main themes of this movie. Um, evidently, Mr. Rogers did it all the time with all kinds of people and in a tremendous act of compassion. The movie's very moving. You will cry. And there's an article. It's based on an article written in Esquire in 1998. You can Google it and read the article. Um, a guy who, um, and he, the writer, is depicted in the movie. His name is changed in the movie. He asks that his name be changed. And you can read the Esquire article. It, too, will make you cry. Um, and there are a bunch of articles as well that have uh, appeared since. I think it's a very important film, and it has to do with just this subject of how to work with the emotions and how to be kind and present uh, for your life. He talks about analytical meditation, which really means studying um, some of these profound ideas, such as the fact that things have no true existence. There are logical arguments that uh, you can study that will convince you logically that things don't have any true substance, uh, ongoing uh, substance in time. Um, and that those are helpful, helpful. They convince us. But what's most important is to begin to experience it in your meditation practice. He talks about, this is right out of the Mr. Rogers movie, befriending intense emotions. A friend of mine wrote me and he said, uh, this movie is about male anger and the tremendous damage that it does in the world. And that do we have a possibility of transforming this before it destroys us? And my friend said, I'm not optimistic. He's a psychologist. He says, if we do not become familiar with our emotions, then we will always fear them, even more so in the bardos after death, when they appear as like dream states. When we fear something, we avoid it. But if we were forced to become more intimate, the fear might dissolve. We need to learn to work more with scary people anyone who frightens or intimidates us. When we get to know them, we can become friends and nobody harms anyone. Hopefully. He see, he's talking about instead we can make friends with our emotions as we contemplate them and gradually learn more about them. If we le rely on this approach when our emotions come up, we will not want to run and hide. We will be able to say, oh, this is my friend anger and I know how to talk to this anger. I know how to subdue it. And if you don't know how, then you just go into action. And in the bardos of death, the bardo of becoming in particular, it will not serve you. It will 
be very, very harmful. Just as though you were caught in a dream about ang fear and anger at night, and it was a nightmare. You can live a nightmare in the bardo of becoming. When we know how to work with our emotions in the bardo of this life, they are no longer obstacles. They become vehicles for our awakening, both now and in the bardos of death. That's the thing about these teachings. They're all about death, but they're all about life. It's the same thing. So <clears throat> there's basically, there are two stages of meditation. Um, the, in the bardo of this life, we practice shamatha. Um, Vipassana is really for the bardo of meditation itself. Shamatha means calming the mind. And um, you bring it back out of thought. It has three main benefits, shamatha meditation. One is um, that you come out of thought into awareness of something. With shamatha, you're focusing on an object in the present moment. It could be your breath. It could be a statue in front of you. It could be a mantra, as in transcendental meditation. Lots of things. But you're focusing your mind one pointedly on that object. And in doing so, you come out of dream. And that is the first main benefit, that you're awakening from dream. And dream is so full of anxiety. And when you come into that present, that a clear, focused, one-pointed awareness of the object, there is no more anxiety. So you get a rest. That's why it's called shamatha. Shamatha means abiding in peace, resting in peace. Second benefit is you begin to realize how much you're thinking. Most people, until they try to come present in one way or another, have no idea. They're just thinking, thinking, thinking. In fact, after 50 years, I find myself thinking, 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 and I haven't been noticing it for the last period of time, whatever. The third benefit What is the third benefit? Oh, that you begin to be able to focus your mind. It's like building a muscle. And that's a useful skill to have as you move into Vipassana, although ultimately you'll let it go. You won't need it. It will really be more about relaxation than focus. But especially in the beginning, it's a very useful tool to be able to focus your mind. And in particular, I often find, you know, sometimes at night I can't sleep. And I'm trying there, and I'm just thinking, 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 lost in thought. I practice shamatha. I come back, and I just watch the breath go in and out, in and out. And in a moment, I'm asleep. It's because it cuts the anxiety. Thought is so full of anxiety. And it's a great practice to do that at night when you can't sleep. And then he says the bardo of meditation, which we haven't gotten to tonight, is the practice of Vipassana as opposed to the bardo of this life. Then he goes into the preliminaries, and I'm, we're not going to spend a lot of time on this. There are the four common preliminaries, which are really contemplations, um, which we could do easily. We could do them here. Uh, they are that the main four preliminaries, the common preliminaries, are the contemplation that this life is precious opportunity to achieve enlightenment, and we shouldn't just dream our way through it. Uh, that death is very real and comes without warning. It can just take you in a second. And I know many instances of this. Tragic instances. And even when you know that it's coming, I've seen it number of times it comes as a surprise to the person who knew, who saw it coming, who, who had a prognosis and a time given to them. And yet when it comes, it's a surprise. And then the third uh, reminder is uh, that karma, which is all of the past habituations that you've stored in your unconscious, they call it the alia in, in Buddhism, are going to rule you. They come, they come present. 
You see somebody who reminds you of a person you hate, and bang, you hate that person too. You see somebody who reminds you of a person who's kind to you, and you have kindly dispositions toward them. All kinds of things like that. We walk down the street, and you think, this is a good day, this is a bad day. You look down, you see dog shit, you don't like it. You look up, you see the beautiful sky, you think this is a nice day. We're, we're constantly swayed by the habituations of our emotions. They color our days. And it's time to wake up from that. That's what this is about. And the fourth reminder um, is that unless you wake up, you will spin through these dreams forever and ever for countless lifetimes, lifetimes in a figurative sense, in a literal sense. Uh, the, the way that reminder goes in the version that I chant is um, samsara, meaning confusion, suffering. Samsara is an ocean of suffering, unendurable, unbearably intense. That's the opposite of waking up. And then the four uncommon preliminaries are what we call in um, Tibetan Buddhist practice, nundro, the preliminaries of, uh, they are the preliminaries to tantric practice. And they are consist of uh, the 100,000 practices, you do 100,000 prostrations while you're taking refuge and um, dedicating yourself to the benefit of sentient beings with a visualization. And you actually throw yourself on the floor and stand up 100,000 times. Uh, it's quite strenuous. And um, it'll take you quite a while at the age everyone is here. <laughs> and there's some of us who are past it. You'll never do full prostrations, I don't think, Joe. Uh, not 100,000. And um, but there, there are bys, bypasses for people with physical problems. You know, uh, you can do cut down versions of a hundred thousand prostrations. When you, if you're twenty, there are no excuses. Uh, when I was forty, there were no excuses. Um, but today, I couldn't possibly even do a prostration, <laughs> not very well. And then there are a hundred thousand uh, Vajrasattva mantras. This is a purification process. You're purifying yourself of, of uh, bad habits and uh, defiling emotions. And there's a practice about involving a visualization. You recite uh, a mantra 100,000 times. It's a 100-syllable hundred mantra. Takes a little while to do that. And then there's the 100,000 mandala offerings. You make an offering using a mandala plate, and you're symbolically offering everything to the universe. And finally, there are 100,000 recitations of a, of a guru y yoga um, mantra where you are, are expressing your gratitude to the lineage that has handed down these teachings to you. And those are the preliminaries. And he talks about the, these are all part of the bardo of this life when you're practicing. And he talks about um, postures. Really, the rest of this, we're not going to go into shamatha with an external object the white bindu visualization, the red bindu visualization, shamatha without object. Um, because the reason being that we're not doing shamatha very much here. Um, we teach people shamatha initially. We want them to have had some experience of shamatha. And then we want to get on into vipassana very fast. That's the way my teacher uh, presented it to Westerners. Because vipassana is really where it's at. He recommends, this is an interesting one. I haven't tried this, but I think I might. Um, many short sessions. Pamasambhava, he's up there on the wall. You can take a look at him afterwards. That's his, one of his peaceful aspects. Pamasambhava is, is a teacher. Um, there are eight main aspects of Pamasambhava, and uh, some of them are quite scary. Um, his wrathful aspect that he assumed when he went to Tibet to deal with all those people who were obstructing the arrival of the, of the Buddhism. He as assumed this red, really wrathful countenance. And, um, but he says to keep sessions short and repeat them again and again, especially if you're doing Vipassana. Because what you do by keeping a session short is you keep it to the point you know, where you're awake. And you don't sit there dreaming, 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 and then come back. You know, 
you keep it short and then you stop for a while grab a cup of coffee come back and do it again stop for a while scratch your bum come back and do it again yeah. and I think it's a it's a great idea um, we tend to uh, want to think be heroic and have longer sessions and then he talks about deity yoga and we're not going to get into that this is pure Vajrayana practice but it's really uh, another version of shamatha and vipassana plus some serious add-ons um, and he says he recommends setting a specific intention for a practice I'm doing this to transcend my negative emotions and my ego clinging. That was a good one. It is important for us to confront our disturbing emotions and ego clinging as directly as we can. We look at our mind and identify our dominant emotion as accurately as possible. That is our target. And by target, he means bringing it to awareness, not acting it out, not trying to get rid of it by repressing it or catharting it. I still think it's very suspicious that old, that that old saw, that psycho psychoanalytic psycho saw, that if you're depressed, it's repressed anger. You know, that's one way of getting rid of anger. You repress it, but then it comes out as depression. And that's it. I'm going to stop there. The importance of coming awake. Vipassana is just the name for that. The importance of waking up to our lives in this present moment. It's our practice. As we walk down the street, it's so important to have a daily practice. And I speak as one who for years didn't practice daily. I'd go off into, and do it in bursts, you know, go off on retreat for a month in solitary retreat go off and do a program for a month, for th three months, and then come back and go for months and months barely meditating at all. It really is important to do it daily. It has a profound effect. It's like it drips. You don't even notice it, and then you do, like water dripping on a stone. Even short daily is, is terrific because the biggest thing problem the hardest thing about meditating daily or any other time is that we're interrupting that neurotic speed of constantly moving forward of wanting to t exercise that tension that's inside us you know get rid of it cathart it go into action do something eat get laid you know get busy um, whatever it might be and really, you're cutting that speed every time you sit down to meditate. So even if you're just meditating for five minutes, just remember what he said? Short is great. Short and clear. So that's it. We can have a discussion. There's a mic we could pass. I think you said that the bardo of the dharmata was associated with Sambhogakaya. Yes, it is. And I was wondering if there's an association to the other kayas? There is. At the end of the um, painful bardo of dying, which we will go through in detail, the first part of it is the body shutting down. And they talk about it in terms of elements. Earth dissolves into water, water into fire, fire into wind, wind into space or consciousness. And the, bo the body is dying, is shutting down. And then mind dissolves. And um, there's a description of how that happens. The, it, it's moving in the central channel. You remember I talked about the channels here? The central channel um, is the Avaduti, also called the uh, Uma in Tibetan, uh, and um, uh, thoughts come down into the heart center from the crown of your head up from the secret center uh, to the heart center, and they dissolve there. All the thoughts dissolve, and at the moment of complete dissolution, 
of the mind. That's death. And there is a point, at that point, if you have trained, since all thought has dissolved, all that's left is utter clarity, luminous clarity. And at that point, if you can have trained enough, you can rest in that completely, giving your loyalty to that and not to these fictional thoughts, and you achieve enlightenment. But if you don't, and most people don't, most people don't even see it, that moment of the luminous, because they haven't trained properly. And the way, how do you train? Vipassana. Coming present. That's the training. Do you see this luminous emptiness, stillness, again and again and again, and you begin to come, get familiar with it so that you recognize it when it presents itself, the real thing. See, what we do is practice, and there's a kind of artificiality to it because we're watching ourselves do it. But there's also a realness to it because the experience is real. But there's also this watcher, subtle, subtler and subtler. But at the moment of death, there's no watcher. It's just the real thing. And at that point, there's a possibility of dissolving into it. Now, that is the Dharmakaya. Pure emptiness. Kadak, they call it. Kadak means alpha pure. Alpha pure of what? Alpha pure of any notion of existence, of being, of svabhava. It's empty of that. Pure emptiness. Dharmakaya. But if you miss that, then you go into the uh, bardo of, Pica of uh, reality, dharmata, bardo of dharmata, chuni bardo. And there you see all the arisings of these appearances in emptiness, and they arise very, very colorfully. You see wrathful deities, you see peaceful deities, the Buddhas, you see realms, you see the, two sh the heavens, you know, all this. It's going to be described, and you see the six realms, too. That's the Sambhogakaya. And if at that point you fail to stay there because your mind is still too lost in thought, then you move on to the bardo of the coming, and that is the Nirmanakaya bardo. And there um, you actually see yourself uh, as a child. Your dream, it's like a dream state. But in that dream, you are a child of about seven years, six, seven years old. And it's Nirmanakaya, you know, it's full uh, embodiment, but it's still a dream. So yeah, through all three kayas are represented. <laughs> There's an argument between the Nyingmas and the Kargyus about that moment after the mind has died, that moment of utter clarity, whether that is before the Bardo of Dharmata or is within the bardo of dharmata. And the Nyingmas say it's within, and the Kagyus say it's without. <laughs> I don't, who cares? <laughs> I don't, maybe somebody could explain to me why this is so important, but I, I, haven't, I haven't heard it yet. Cliff, pass the mic. Can you, um experience that dissolving into uh, that luminous emptiness in this life. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. There are people who there are people who have before they even begin to die have already are dwelling in that. And for them there is no death. Because there's no individual to experience any loss. It's just change. And in fact, this is what is recommended for us. If you can do this, you stay in this open awareness with delight. This is the best way to die. With confidence, lack of fear, with complete openness, and with curiosity. How about that one? That you're curious about, it's like going to a new country. You know, you're curious, what's going to come next? You know, Trungpa Rinpoche emphasized that. In fact, um, I've, I feel like I'm telling the same stories again, but 
stop me if you've heard this one, uh, <laughs> when Roshi was dying, they were very, very close. Suzuki Roshi, the master of Zen Center in San Francisco, he died in 71 or 72, I forget. And uh, they, were they loved each other. Didn't spend a lot of time with each other, but what little time they spent was really quality. <laughs> Mostly, they would sit together in front of students having a conversation about the difference between Prajna and Jnana, for instance. And Rinpoche would rehearse this before he went to see Roshi with us, discussing it with us, to get ready to have it with this conversation with Roshi. And then the two of them would talk. Roshi had a very thick Japanese accent, and Rinpoche had this sort of Oxonian, Tibetan English accent. You wondered how the hell they understood each other. They loved each other. They did. When Roshi was dying, here's another movie recommendation. Roshi's favorite movie was a movie called Ikiru, according to some of his students who told me this. It's a Kurosawa flick. The irony of it is that that movie is about a modern day bureaucrat who is living a heartless, meaningless, empty life, half dead. And until he discovers that he's dying of, lung, of uh, stomach cancer. That's what Roshi died of, stomach cancer. Great irony, huh? And so Trumpa Rinpoche went to visit him in the hospital. And when he came back, uh, we were sitting around like this. And someone asked him, well, how's Roshi doing? And he said, he's dying like a true Buddhist. And someone asked him, what does that mean? How, what, how do you die like a true Buddhist? He said, he's curious about his own death. Curiosity is really recommended that you, 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 that you go into it, you know, if, if you've achieved that moment that Cliff was talking about, you know, that, then you can go into death with clarity, with utter confidence, no fear, interest. What's gonna happen next? And it's the same way we're enjoined to live our lives. With confidence, delight, clarity, cheerfulness. There's a practice for you in the morning to cheer up as you sit down to do your morning meditation. That's a, that's a powerful practice. Rinpoche used to just beg us to cheer up. He'd look out at his at an audience of his students and say, please cheer up. Please cheer up. <laughs> I never could figure out exactly why, but now I really know. <laughs> John, I was wondering if uh, there's any correlation between uh, bardo, which as you said means interval, and uh, what Trungpa Rinpoche referred to as the gap. He, he did say that uh, uh, the Vipassana practice, which is a way of experiencing the gap, is preparation for death. So is there some connection there? What are your thoughts? Maybe they're even the same thing? No, I think that this is the case, that the gap, you see, is complete presence. It's a gap between thoughts of I. When you go out with the breath, this is shamatha and vipassana mixed, and the breath goes out, and at the end of the outbreath, he used to say, gap. I don't say it because I'm afraid people won't understand. I say, go out with the breath, you're here. Go out with the breath, pause. Go out with the breath, rest. Go out with the breath, and now you're completely present. He used to say, go out with the breath, and at the end of the outbreath, Gap. So it's out breath, dissolve, gap. Now in the gap, there are no bardos. Bardos are the things of confusion. In enlightened mind, there is there are no bardos. Nothing begins and ends. <laughs> That's what a bardo is all about. Something that began and ended. Isn't that something? No bardos in enlightenment. No bardos every time you come present. If 
fully present. And he enjoined us, you know, the, this, these teachings enjoin us not only to come present, but then to appreciate the beauty, the luminous beauty of this present moment. But didn't you say life itself is a bardo? I, I, I mean, it, 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 if you're present to life, um, is there bardo or not? It's only a bardo when we believe in my life, my birth, my death. Then it's a bardo. Yeah. There are no bardos in the Enlightenment. They're free of the bardos. It's just endless change. Mm. Yeah, okay. Think about it. It's like in the gap, there are no bardos. Or don't think about huh? it. Huh? Or, or don't yeah, think don't about think it. About <laughs> thank, you, thank you. That's better. Yeah. Yeah, there's no self in the gap. There's no time in the gap. There's no space in the gap. There's no birth in the gap. There's no death in the gap. I guess not. <laughs> you're guessing? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, it just, it, it's a matter of speech, but I think, I think you're right, yeah. There's none of that. Time, self, birth, death, all those things in here to a belief in I. It's a gap prior to thought. After the gap, you can create all of that stuff and that story that you're going to talk about what it is, but in the gap, no thought. I like that, no problem. Well, okay, everybody. Um, we actually have some snacks for snacks. <laughs> people. Listen, I want to ask everyone, if you can, please make a $10 donation. Um, we've got enough people here to pay the rent, um, and which is 80 bucks. I shouldn't even be saying this on the recording, but all of you people out there listening to the recording will now know. And um, so if you can make a donation, please do. And let's end with a dedication of the merit for the benefit of all sentient beings. By this merit, may all attain omniscience. May it defeat the enemy wrongdoing from the stormy waves of birth, old age, and death, from the ocean of samsara, may I free all beings. By the of the golden sun of the great east, May the lotus garden of the Rigdon's wisdom bloom. May the dark ignorance of sentient beings be dispelled. May all beings enjoy profound, brilliant glory.